Yes, <clears throat> it was my really pleasure uh, to be invited to this conference. Uh, like, thanks, Wide, for inviting me. Uh, so, uh, I just give some responses to the two presentations. Uh, I think that my comments just have some general. Uh, issues also have some specific issues, something like that. The first uh, is that I would like to uh, say that's really two excellent presentation indeed. The presentations discuss the two very important issues in the world distribution studies indeed. The first is that the global, the world's distribution, uh, so how to the measure the pre precisely the global, the wealth inequality in the world and its dynamic change over time. That's so important indeed. So the second is that you see in inheritance and inheritance taxes, whether reduce or increase wealth inequality in the countries, so because we have some belief, inheritance will increase the wealth inequality, something like that. But uh, the Daniel's presentation gave us some new evidence that in some countries it may not be correct. So that, I think that two important issues is so important for studying the wealth distribution, yeah. Uh, the third one is that some result from two presentations are so exciting. You see, when I uh, read that, I really learned a lot from that. You see, also so significantly important. Uh, from the Jim's presentation, we know the lot of the results. So that is, you say, 50 percent, the bottom 50 percent of adults has a worse share, the less than one percent, less than one percent. So while top five percent have a share greater than 75 percent, top one percent greater than the 48 percent, the Gini coefficient in 2014 is so high. The, you see, close to 0 0.91, so coincidence, indeed. Uh, so also, the James presentation addressed another very important issue. So the passion, you see, should be included as a component of wealth household wealth, let's say. Uh, but the impact of the pension on the wealth inequality is a difference from one country to another. That have reduced inequality, wealth inequality, for example, in Australia, by increase by in the Canada, something like that. That's so yeah, different from one country to another. Uh, also, Jim rest the questions, also important issues, that really we need some better data. For example, for the up down income wealth distribution, also we need better data for collecting the sampling and the measurement errors, something like that. A lot of work to do to get, you see, precise the figures for the wealth distribution, either in country or in the world. So from the Daniel, the presentations, uh, I will have some impression that the data are so unique and so valuable indeed. You see, so large sample of data, you see. Also, he mentioned two very, very important 
very, very interesting result. I just mentioned that. So I based on the data from Sweden, you see, inheritance uh, unequally distributed. That is expected. But inheritance reduce the wealth inequality. That is, I did not expect it. Also, inheritance taxes play the minus rule, but they increase the wealth inequality. Increase wealth inequality, that's it. So I think that result, even are consistent with some studies in other countries, but I don't know that result can be find some evidence in developing countries. I was thinking about that. Whether if we have the data in, from China, whether we can get some result, I'm not sure. Perhaps the result are opposite indeed. The rich people will have more inheritance and pass down to their children. So based on this result, so I have some questions that is even the Daniel mentioned that the data include the both year errors and non errors inherited and not yet inherited the people. So, but uh, this impact are only amongst errors, something like that. There seems no very, evid very strong evidence show whether, you see, inheritance will reduce wealth inequality you see, between inherited and the non-inherited. Uh, second, the question is that, that I uh, do not really understand the why in the Swedish societies, the less wealthy people just receive more inheritance than the wealthy people. The why? There are some mechanisms, maybe some policy. Is yeah. With, so that is for the uh, my. That is my general comments on that. Yeah. Just come to some specific issues, mainly related to the gym's presentations. The first is that how to get the worst data for top 10, indeed. The gym mentioned several the channels to do that. So you agree with that. So when the method is that just use the information from Forbes and the other rich list, something like that. Uh, but I don't know if the data from Forbes are reliable or not in the other countries. But as I know that, the information is not so reliable for China. When the Forbes published some number of the billionaire in China. The Chinese people don't believe that. Even some rich people do not believe that. They say, I'm not in the fools. I think my assets are much more than that, something like that. So that is what you think about. Yes, the information from Forbes can be used for the different countries that uh, my second uh, the concern is about that you see I think the chief did very good job to reestimate the share of the top ten or top twenty percent of the rich people is by correcting the figure from the household survey, that is. For example, yeah, for the data 
in 2002 in China. So the share, you see, <coughs> of the 20, top 20 or top 10, <coughs> uh, is underestimated. Yeah, we know that. But how to correct it, right? So from the, the report, you see the share is much higher than that from the household service. That means uh, that big difference, you see, is based on some estimations. Uh, because I do not know what is the method used that. Yeah. According to my understandings or our data, I think uh, perhaps uh, use the estimate the share of the top 10, top uh, 20 the rich people according to some method. May have some, you see, overestimating problem. So for example, in 2002, you see, uh, just because at that time, China just started the housing reforms. That means the housing access is very limited. Also, you see, uh, the number of billionaires was uh, quite small. As uh, you see, Jimmy's presentation in 2001, only one people is on the list of folks. So, also the size of a private firm was small, that. So, that means there are not so large number of rich people at that time. So, that we should think about how can you see estimate the top share top share of the top ten or top twenty people. Uh, so also Jim mentioned this, our new data set that is perhaps I just talk a little bit more about the new data set. Uh, so we collect the new data set with a lot of information on the household wealth, like uh, housing assets and financial assets, product, production assets, such as. So we did some rough estimations about that. So Jim mentioned the figure I told him is about the report. Six five. This figure, yeah, uh, maybe is underestimated. We will do re-estimations, try to find, yeah, get a more precise figures. Uh, so, present figure is between zero point six five to zero point seven, something like that. That depends on whether we should consider, you see, uh, include some top tier information, consider, do some correction for sample bias, something like that. So yeah, I will yeah, tell the team and also audience, yeah, when we get some new data, I can find some figure that is. Okay, thank you. Our last speaker this morning is uh, uh, Sub Subu Subramanian from uh, who's at, uh, Chennai, and again, been uh, very much uh, involved in our work on wealth over the last 10 years. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try and keep this brief. I'd like to concentrate on just three issues. And I'll deal with each of these uh, as briefly as I possibly can, because I can see that uh, we're getting on close to lunchtime. 
Uh, the first issue will have to do with some general remarks on the subject of inquiry. The second will have to do with uh, uh, a few quick headline points about wealth inequality in India. And the third will be on a specific issue relating to the measurement of inequality. Uh, with regard to some gentle comments on the subject of inquiry, it is very welcome to notice that the subject of the distribution of wealth, as opposed to the distribution of income or of consumption expenditure, is beginning to acquire a certain salience in the, in the field. And I think this has a great deal to do with the initiative which Wider undertook in 2006 with the publication of the book, uh, uh, Personal Assets from a Global Perspective. And indeed, I mean, the sort of attention which, say, the work of Milanovic justly has attracted on the global distribution of income is something which has not quite been paralleled by work on the distribution of uh, wealth, and not least because I think there has not been a great deal of applied or empirical work on this, on this subject which is a little surprising considering the importance of endowments in the scheme of things in theoretical economics. After all, the second or fundamental theorem of welfare economics has uh, much to do with uh, uh, the, the, the role of wealth or of endowments in general in uh, uh, assessing the goodness of end states of affairs. Uh, and in particular, if you recall, the second theorem says that any desired allocation can be sustained as a Pareto optimum for uh, uh, an appropriate redistribution of initial endowments. And then there is the work of people like Amartya Sen who have pointed to the centrality of endowments in determining entitlements. And indeed, if you go back to the 1970s, following on the work on distributional justice by Nozick, there was a resurgence of interest again in the role of endowments in uh, securing notions of both efficiency and uh, fairness as reflected in the work of people like Hal Varian. So, um, and, and of course, I mean, this has a much longer history going back to the work of people like Thomas Paine in his Rights of Man when he talked about estate duty. So it is very welcome to see this whole subject making a reappearance in its new empirical incarnation in terms of both general treatments of the distribution of wealth and in particular of the distribution of uh, the impact of inheritances on the distribution of wealth. Now, having said that, I'll move on very quickly to some uh, headline points relating to the distribution of wealth in India. As uh, Jim pointed out, we have decennial estimates which are available through surveys on the distribution of household assets in India. And we have data going back to the 1950s, in fact. But if we look at the last three, four decades, 81, 91, 2002, 03, and the latest set of data, which is available for the year 2009-11, uh, sorry, 2012-13, what we notice is the following. Per capita levels of wealth have increased tremendously in India, although India is still a wealth-wise very poor country in the national scheme, in the international global scene. Uh, the per adult uh, wealth holding in India, and I'm talking about assets, not of debt wealth, net wealth, net worth, is of the order of about 12,000 US dollars, whereas for Sweden, which is number one on the list, it is $237,000. So there is a huge distinction between mm, a relatively poor country like India and the better off countries. But even so, if, if uh, Welfare is an increasing function of mean levels of wealth holding and a declining function of inequality, then it's particularly unfortunate that in India uh, the distribution of wealth has been increasing quite rapidly. But more on the average level of household assets, between 1981 and 2011-12, in rural India, household mean per capita household assets have increased by a factor of four, and in urban India by a factor of nine. Uh, the gross rates in per capita income, in per capita, uh, or rather in per household wealth holdings, uh, have been of the order of 3.8% between 81 and 91 for rural India, which went down to 2.4% between 91 and 2002, and has gone up considerably to 8.2% for 
for the for the for the latest round of data between 2002 and 2012 13 in urban india these rates are 6% 4% and a whopping big 13% uh, so what we have is that india is a comparatively poor country that there's been a very sharp increase in wealth per household over the last decade and indeed uh, conventional measures of inequality suggest that there has also been a huge increase in uh, 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 the distribution of wealth in terms of standard indices such as the Gini coefficient. And there has also been a large increase in the intersectoral distribution of wealth. The ratio of urban to rural per, per household wealth has increased from rough parity in 1981, 1.03, to 2.27 in the latest round of uh, survey data that we have. So, um, and Many of the predictable features of a decomposition of wealth by, by caste or by uh, occupational status confirm our worst suspicions that while overall inequality has increased, both within group and between group inequality levels have increased, with the f first far outstripping the second uh, in terms of both caste and occupation. In terms of caste, the forward castes have done clearly uh, much, much better than the scheduled castes and tribes. And in terms of occupation, the self-employed category has done vastly better than uh, casual and organized labor. Uh, in terms of the composition of wealth in India, it is still land and buildings which account for the lion's share of wealth, as opposed to financial assets which have a fairly dominant role to play in more advanced economies. This could have something to do with underreporting of uh, financial wealth, uh, but then so is uh, underreporting, especially in the value of wealth, a feature of both land and buildings. So it's still real estate which accounts for physical real estate, which accounts for a bulk of wealth in India, and it's a question of time before the bubble bursts and one wonders what the harvest will be when that actually happens. So that's that's briefly about wealth inequality in India. Let me just wind up with. Uh, uh, one point on measurement. I recall in one of his papers, Tony Shorrocks had mentioned that we have a tendency to stick with certain conventional ways of looking at measurement for reasons of what he called inertia and network effects. And this is no more uh, in evidence than in the measurement of inequality in general. We tend to stick very often with relative measures of inequality. So we have the old workhorse, the Gini coefficient, or the coefficient of variation. Now, why this is of some salience is something that I discovered uh, by simply reinventing the wheel when I was looking at the inclusiveness of the growth process in India, and I found that one way in which one could approach the problem was to think of the distribution of the product of growth in an equitable manner, analogously to problems in uh, the optimal uh, uh, allocation of an anti-poverty fund, or an analogy with the Talmudic bankruptcy problem, where you have uh, 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 different patterns of egalitarian distribution of a given stock among competing contenders for them. And I found that if I resorted to the least egalitarian of possible egalitarian divisions of the product of growth, namely an equal distribution across quantiles, then the results on inclusiveness of growth which I got were very different from the standard results, which were to the effect that in India, inequality in the distribution of consumption is not a major problem because most relative indices of inequality indicate a rough stationarity in the level of inequality. And this is also very much the case with, with wealth, where in fact there was actually a decline in the Gini coefficient of inequality insofar as urban India was concerned. So this takes us back to a very old problem. I mean, uh, relative indices of inequality uh, invoke the scale invariance axiom, namely the notion that inequality is invariant with respect to equal proportionate increases of income or of wealth. Whereas in a problem which has been known from at least the 1970s, largely due to the efforts of Christoph Kohn, there is a rival to the scale invariance pro uh, property, which is the translation invariance property which says that inequality invariance is preserved not by equal proportionate increases in wealth or consumption or income, but by equal absolute increases in wealth or income. 
Now, uh, it is arguable, as indeed Com has argued, that in the presence of wealth, in the presence of growth, uh, relative measures tend to be rightest in their ideological orientation. And translation invariant indices, absolute indices, tend to be leftist. And there is a case for intermediate or central measures. Now, as it happens, these measures do exist, but much of it has been localized to a somewhat arcane discussion of these issues in the theoretical literature on inequality measurement. Uh, but if we regard the composability of an inequality index as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an important property, uh, and also the property of unit consistency, namely the requirement that the inequality index uh, must rank distributions in the same way, irrespective of the units in which income is measured or wealth is measured. So if these properties are important, then virtually the only index which is available, intermediate or centrist index which is available for performing this job, is an index due to a person called Kritscher. The Kritscher index, as it happens, has a very nice interpretation. It is simply the product of the, of the, of the coefficient of variation and the standard deviation. So it's a product of a well-known relative index and of an absolute index. And why this is of some importance, apart from the fact that, I mean, at a theoretical level, this might engage the attentions of those who have a fancy for this sort of thing, is that on the ground, it makes a huge difference. Now, if we're going to be, I mean, whether or not inequality is good is, is a normative issue, and there are those who hold that it has very deleterious consequences for, for efficiency, for the prospect of conflict, for any intrinsic notion of fairness that you might have, and indeed also instrumentally on health outcomes. Now these are surely matters that can and should be debated, but very often these issues are thrown out of the uh, ambit of inquiry or debate by virtue of the fact that the diagnosis is to the effect that there has been little or no change in inequality, especially in a country like India. And this is because of this exclusive reliance on uh, uh, relative measures of inequality. And even if you don't go in for an absolute measure, but if you were to confine yourself to centrist measures, such as an intermediate Gini coefficient or an intermediate Kritscher measure, then we find that the increases in wealth inequality in India are of an order which uh, my colleague Jairaj has been working on this, caused the graph to actually skip the page. Okay, so there have been huge increases in inequality uh, once we take account of absolute differences. And I suspect that this is also going to have implications for your own findings on the impact of both taxation and of inheritance on, uh, uh, on wealth inequality. If you were to use not an, uh, uh, a relative measure, but uh, a centrist measure, then I think that would be more in conformity with ordinary intuition in these matters, namely that wealth inequalities will have been seen to have increased with inheritances and with a progressive income taxation. So that is all I have to say. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, well, I thank you uh, all the speakers for some very interesting uh, uh, comments. Um, I have to say, I think this is very much a topic for the future. I mean, wealth has not been very prominent in the past, but I, I, can have I can be reasonably sure that it will become much more important in the future. And for some of the reasons which the, the, uh, the uh, speakers have, have talked about, I just want to mention one thing about which Daniel didn't bring out, but I think is important in inheritance. It's not so much just what the impact is on wealth inequality, but it's also on the intergenerational aspects. I think that's what's the main, uh, one of the driving uh, reasons why we're interested uh, and we think uh, inheritance is so important. And this is tied up with the fact that the wealth to income ratios have been rising throughout the world and particularly quite strongly in developing countries. That means that wealth in, relative to income is becoming more important. And the fact that it's easier to pass on wealth assets are easier to pass on than income is that it raises these concern, not just about the fact that inequality is going up, but it, it is going to become more persistent through time, and that the old fashioned ideas about uh, that people can simply uh, you know, do well for themselves and uh, 
you can, uh, uh, this, this question about whether or not uh, the children will be able to find their way in life and, and do well, irrespective of their family's backgrounds, I think is, is, is the issue about whether that's going to be challenged in the future. And I think that's one of the driving concerns. And it's not easy to, perhaps to articulate that or even to, uh, to predict what's going to happen and do analysis on that. But I think that that is what is uh, very much uh, behind some of the concerns about uh, growth of wealth and wealth inequality. Um, we are a little bit late, I know, um, but uh, we started late, and I think we have a, a little time for some questions. So um, if there are people that would like to raise questions, I think I'd rather do that rather than have the speakers respond uh, immediately. Um, do I have some takers? Yes, please. Excellent. Um, is there anyone else that wants to ask uh, questions that we can... Yeah, uh, I'm truly in Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. I learned a lot from the presentation and uh, responses, comments. It's very good. Uh, just uh, one question to Jim Davis. Uh, that, uh, uh, because I didn't read your paper, I don't know how do you deal with the land uh, for example, in China, although the uh, agricultural land does not belong to the household, but the household, in fact, have the land if it uh, rent or leased to others, those households could get continuously the rent. So I don't know how did you deal with the land, your calculation. Perhaps in 2002 data, the distribution of land is uh, relatively uh, even, but now the land distribution is very uneven. I don't know how do you deal with. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anyone else that wants to? Uh, I, I see we're losing people, and I think lunch is uh, is beckoning. Let's have one more. Uh, uh, comment question and then perhaps let the speakers have a last uh, a few comments and then we'll have to just uh, perhaps deal with questions uh, thank outside you for, the hall. Thank you. Thank you for having the opportunity to ask a question and thank you for the excellent presentations. First place, my name is Adrian Perels um, from the Finnish Metallurgical Institute doing climate impact assessment there. So my background is economics and not meteorology. Um, I have a, a question for the related to the presentation of Mr. Waldenström. Um, I was wondering about sort of the the portability of his of his results, uh, and also in fact the durability of his results. In that sense, how how important are, for example, changes in household formation over time to what is happening with these heritage transfers? So if households start to have less or more children, or if uh, couples uh, are getting older, but for example, the woman is getting much older than the man, for example, which has happened for some time, how that kind of processes are influencing how this, how this is unfolding. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, let me uh, then, uh, I think, perhaps, uh, who should we start? Let's Daniel start, I think, and then we'll reverse the... Let Jim then finish. So, now I'd just like would, would like to thank the commenters for their comments, and I I think in the interest of time, I think we uh, the, the last question on from the floor on on the role of family formation. At least, what we f looked at was whether the rich had more children. Would that whether that could explain the patterns? And, and in fact. It did not in, in the Swedish case, uh, but of, of course, over time, demographics would matter uh, a lot, uh, in, and we see an increasing uh, degree of, of assortative mating in the Western world, I think, so that uh, could mean that at, at the household level, these inequalities much, may, may even become uh, uh, magnified when we take that perspective into account, but this is a big discussion, and you know. I, I settled here. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, uh, I just have one uh, quick comment actually on uh, Daniel's paper, which I, I think is uh, 
very interesting. Um, I think it would also, if it you know, is conceivably possible or could be done, interesting to look at the uh, impact of inheritance on the distribution of lifetime wealth in the sense of the present value of people's lifetime labor earnings uh, plus their inheritance. Uh, so if, if inheritance actually equalized the distribution of people's lifetime wealth, uh, that would be even more striking. Um, just uh, in reply to the question that was asked about uh, land, um, uh, just for clarification for people in general, the uh, urban land is not included in these estimates because it's not owned in any sense by the uh, urban dwellers. It belongs to the state. Um, agricultural land, uh, there is a, a kind of a well-developed uh, tradition going back to the 1980s, as I understand it, in China of uh, how to estimate the value of the agricultural land. There's not a market for the land, so you have to estimate the value. And the imputed value is based on the present value of the net uh, income that can be earned on that land. But the question that was asked about the impact of the la land being leased out, I don't know the answer, and actually I thought perhaps we could turn to uh, Professor uh, Li Shi to see if he has a comment on that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that is a very good question. Yeah, for China in rural areas, the parents do not own the, the land, uh, but when we calculate the the land values as a part of the wealth, we just use the information of the agriculture value, market value of agriculture products. You see, we suppose, you see, the land as assets, which will, you see, produce returns, something like that. Then we use 5%, the, you see, that long-term interest rate, then imputed the total the value of the land, something like that. I think, yes, Jim is correct. Yes. Okay, well, I think I'll bring the session to a halt, uh, to an end. The, uh, the one comment I make is really that uh, 10 years ago, if we'd uh, had this discussion, we would have been just uh, scrabbling about to get any sort of uh, coherent view about uh, wealth holdings in the world and, and what was going on in terms of wealth and equality trends. Uh, now, as we, we sit down today, I think uh, we've learnt a huge amount in the last 10 years and the whole issue has, has been transformed. Clearly, we do have problems just getting, still getting the data into a form where uh, it's up to the standard that we, we at least, uh, I don't want to say expect, but hope uh, to get in other areas. And I'm thinking, you know, if we had this session again in 10 years' time, I, I suspect that we would again be quite uh, transformed in terms of our understanding and our appreciation and, and some of the topics which we've been, uh, you know, at least grappling with here will be a lot clearer. So um, if you like, watch this space because I think this is one of the topics which is really going to be uh, given a lot of attention in the next 10 years. And I think it is very important, uh, not just amongst economists, but also amongst the wider public. This is a real important uh, important issue for social policy around the world. So I want to thank the speakers um, for uh, coming along and, and talking today. And uh, if there's any issues which people want to raise, do so and just uh, try and grab us uh, outside as well. Thank you very much.